Hey everybody, welcome to NAM. This is Believe in Music Week and you are watching Ultimate Ears TV, Ultimate Ears Pro TV. My name is Nick Marzak. I'm going to be hosting uh, this week. And uh, before we get started, because we have an awesome interview coming up, we have a giveaway to announce. You need to go right now to YouTube, subscribe to the Ultimate Ears Pro channel, and comment on this stream, and that'll make you eligible for one pair of Fits, UE Fits. These are awesome. They are wireless buds. You form them in your ear at home. You could do backflips. You could do cartwheels. It does not matter. They will not fall out. And also, you're eligible for the grand prize of a pair of UE Lives that come with UE Switch. So literally it's a system that the capsule just pops off. You can change colors, customize it, um, put your own logo on it. Come on, you gotta go over to YouTube right now, subscribe to Ultimate Ears Pro channel, and comment on this stream. But just in case uh, you, know, you, you, you miss it, uh, uh, miss the stream, you can go to uh, Ultimate Ears right now and they are running a promotion during NAM. You can get 20% off UE5 and 6s, or, or in-ear monitors, literally, 5 and 6, 20% off uh, using promo code NAM20 or 30% off 7 and up using promo code NAM30. So that only lasts right now during NAM week. It's for US and Canada. Do not miss it. But before we get started, go right now to YouTube. Like, uh, subs subscribe to the Ultimate Ears Pro channel and comment on this stream. That'll make you eligible for the prize. So without further ado, the reason we're here, uh, I am sitting down with uh, a really good friend of mine and also a an Emmy award-winning, a primetime Emmy award-winning re-recording engineer. I'm like jumbling my words. Frank Marone, let's bring him in before I keep messing this up. How are you doing, man? I'm good, how are you? I'm great. I've never been so tongue-tied in my life. You are re-recording and dubbing mixer engineer. Uh, can you tell everybody, just in case they aren't you know, familiar with re-recording, what that means? Sure. Uh, and by the way, I, I really don't care what you call me as long as you call me. <laughs> <That's, laughs> uh, Re-recording just means that uh, when we're uh, mixing, we're taking all of the elements and it's it's an old term that comes from the feature film world but uh, and dubbing mixer is the british version of it but basically what it means is we are just uh, taking all of the elements from all of our team of editors and uh re-recording it after we mix it to a final print master um and uh it it it's yeah, it's just basically a collaboration between all of the editors and, and the, that we end up with all of these tracks in front of us. And it's a, a team of, it used to be a team of three people in the feature world. There'd be one person mixing dialogue, one person mixing music, and one person mixing sound effects and Foley. And uh, now it's more common to have a two-man team. Mm. So there'll be what I do is I mix dialogue and music, and ADR and group, and uh, my partner mixes sound effects and foley. Oh, okay. That, that I was gonna say. It sounds like you have a, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in any way dissing the sound effects guy, but you have dialogue and music. Uh, you know, you give the sound effects. No, I'm just kidding. They they do a lot of work. <laughs> but uh, so, but your experience uh, coming up, you started in music. And by the way, just so everybody knows, we have recorded a podcast called Best in Craft. You can check it out on Ultimate Ears Pro's YouTube channel. Uh, and go right now, subscribe to that page and comment on this stream uh, for your chance to win Fits or UE Lives. But we we have a lot of backstory with Frank. Um, I do want to kind of skip over that to get to the nuts and bolts. And if you have questions out there at home, uh, please write them into the chat uh, on the NAM portal, the Believe in Music portal, or you can uh, also comment on the YouTube stream right now, and we will get to your questions live for Frank to answer. But uh, just give us a, a just you 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 started in music and then kind of found your way into post production through those opportunities. Yes, uh, I started uh, initially. I was uh, 
working in a music studio and uh, that machine behind me was the first machine I ever got and started uh, recording in my basement on a four track. And uh, it got to somebody who uh, owned a recording studio and heard some demos that I'd made and gave me an opportunity to get my foot in the door. And in those days, it was it was really difficult to get into a professional recording studio. So for me, it was a great opportunity to really soak it in because he gave me unlimited access to the multi-tracks that we would record during the day. And uh, he was a great mentor, um, he taught me uh, a lot about uh, miking techniques and different mics and what they did and mixing techniques just by watching him. I would learn through osmosis in his approach of how he did things. And um, after working uh, there for a while, I got the opportunity to start mixing and start it with, uh, he was a composer. So I started recording a lot of the orchestral scores for movies he was working on and uh, uh, got to record a lot of jazz bands, a lot of rock bands, uh, reggae. It really gave me a, a, a deep understanding and appreciation of uh, how, where music sort of has merged between different styles, between country and pop and uh, reggae, and, and just really being able to break it down track by track and see similarities and a lot of, uh, the styles and the differences in a lot of the styles. So uh, I really, I really enjoyed that. But when Pro Tools became prolific and uh, everybody was uh, starting to be able to record from home and uh, uh, I think the professional recording studios started to slow down a lot. And I had always taken the musical scores that I had recorded and gone to the post facilities to see how they were being integrated into the final movie. And I was interested in post and got an opportunity to move from just doing music and get into post-production, which was an entirely different world. It was uh, different uh, disciplines, different uh, crafts, getting a soundtrack for a film or a television show together. And so I went back and I started from scratch. I started recording Foley. I started um, editing dialogue, editing music, and just slowly worked my way back up into a mixing chair. But having done all of those jobs, I had a really great respect and uh, understanding of all of those tracks that were coming and landing on our mixing console as to uh, as to how much work went into them and uh, mm -hmm. uh, really uh, doing my best to respect that work when I and still do. Um, I totally uh, understand how much work it takes to get a soundtrack together and uh, sure it's, it's amazing that it actually does come together but it does and <laughs> we get it out there yeah in your uh, business everything is right at the wire um the so again if you if you want to hear the backstory because frank has an awesome story of you know going to college you went for you know engineering electrical engineering if, if i'm not if i'm remembering correctly and and how you worked yeah. your way up to the, but now he's I mean, you were in New York, you were working on Sex in the City, you were working on, uh, name, name some of your, because it, it was, uh, 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 I know, I know you ended up at loss, but there were things that, that were, you know, you were doing before that. What were some of those projects that kind of built you up to where you are now? Well, I, uh, when I moved to New York City, I was at Tadeo Studios and, uh, I got an opportunity to work with Ron Howard and Tim Burton. I did uh, Ransom, Sleepy Hollow for Tim Burton and uh, <laughs> got to work with uh, uh, for ABC on Sex and the City. And uh, when Lost, when the opportunity came up, they were looking for uh, somebody who, J.J. Abrams really wanted somebody who had not only feature experience, but had, uh, uh, broadcast experience too, because he basically wanted Lost to sound 
theatrical on mm -hmm. and, and he was shooting it on 35 millimeter film he was so focused on sound as well as picture and uh i met with his producer and uh his uh post-production supervisor and uh, the meeting went well and uh, I ended up on that show. That's what brought me to LA in 2004 and uh, the show was tremendously successful fortunately mm -hmm. and uh, um, and I had the opportunities to work. I worked for Disney for you know the whole duration of loss, but then did other projects for them as well for a while, and then moved over to Sony and then, uh, and now I'm a Technicolor. So, uh, you know, I've been lucky. I've, uh, I've just been very fortunate to work with good people and good projects. There's luck and there's also skill because those, uh, you know, those jobs that we're talking about have won you two primetime Emmy awards and five additional nominations. Now you won one for lost and the Kennedys, um, so again, everybody take advantage of Nam. ask Frank questions on this chat on the Nam portal or on YouTube chat, subscribe for your chance to win the prizes. Um, but, uh, I, I want you talked about something just a second ago, uh, that I, that I want to kind of circle back on, which is, um, those are one of those buzzwords that everyone says on a zoom meeting now, like let's circle back to that. Let's put a pin in it. I'm sick of saying it, but now I'm saying it, uh, or I'm sick of hearing it. Um, so you said the difference between broadcast and uh, theatrical, how would you approach those mixes differently? Um, because to someone, you know, that, that doesn't understand the, the, the art of your mix, it seems like, well, don't in both scenarios, don't you want the, you know, dialogue to sound good and the music to support it? Like what is your approach? Is there a difference in your approach to those two, um, you know, categories? Well, it, it's interesting because, uh, the quality of broadcast has come up to theatrical standards, and, but you have to get to that point in a much shorter time frame and mm. uh, with a much smaller budget. And you don't get the luxury of a, a dialogue pre-dub or an effects pre-dub or uh, a Foley pre-dub. Uh, we're basically we go into a mix with a broadcast show in the morning and by the end of the day we have to have that pretty much kicked into shape and that's 40 minutes with a with a wow. feature there an hour and a half and uh again y y you get a bigger budget although the budgets are shrinking now uh but uh what's made it possible with broadcast is just um the tools that we have at hand we've got um uh, we've got great control surfaces plugins have come such a long way as far as um <clears throat> the quality and sounding like i came from the analog world and i mixed my dialogue on mag track and on 24 track tape and so that's in that's embedded in me as to what I want to end up with. That's how I want my dialogue to sound. And at the beginning with Pro Tools, it was really, really difficult to for me to get that that quality and that integrity of the sound, uh, especially in the dialogue and in the music, uh, with what was available to me. And uh, as as with everything with technology, as it's progressed, uh, the tools have gotten better. Uh, the plugins have gotten, you know, they're they're fantastic. And I use uh, plugin versions of things that I was weaned on, like the Lexicon 224 and uh, uh, a lot of the a lot of the the analog processors that I was using and uh, the Massenberg EQs and uh, the plug-in versions that they make of them. I mean, I've really done a lot of a being and really uh, listened carefully and they are so good, uh, you know, that 
I can't tell the difference and I'm <laughs> totally happy with it. And, you know, I talk to a lot of my friends who are, uh, I have a close friend who's uh, uh, a scoring mixer and uh, his setup is still very traditional in the sense that uh, he's got a lot of outboard analog compressors and EQs, and uh, he's got an analog console that his signal goes through. And I, I totally understand that for what he's doing, and I mm -hmm. uh, appreciate it. But with the time constraints that we have and how quickly we have to turn things around, there's we just have to find you know a, a way to get from point A to point B maintain quality and still uh, do it in the time and the budget that we're, we've been given. So um, what's the argument for staying with, uh, you know, like the, the old school analog, you know, pre-automation um, you know, some people even use tape. Like I, I get the, the craftsmanship, the artisanship of recording to analog and there's something, you know, it's like going to Italy and having real bread be made in front of you or something. But uh, is is there, you know, practically, is there an argument to be made for that? Or do you think we are finally at a point where the technology is so, and the plugins, as you mentioned, are so good at replicating a lot of what analog has done uh, that it's, it's, I hate to use the word obsolete because obviously we love tape, we love analog, but, you know, if you're in a time crunch, you don't want to be... <laughs> cutting and splicing tape reels together. You know, you, you want to you want to be going. So is there an argument to be made for still using um, kind of antiquated technologies? Well, I, I think there is because I've done A-B comparisons with him and uh, listened to uh, uh, a lot of music that I'm familiar with going through his analog process. And uh, you do hear a warmth, you do hear the difference, you do hear uh, something that I personally can't pin it. You just know what yeah. you hear is right. And so yeah, I, I think there is validity to that, uh, absolutely. Uh, but again, I, I just have to uh, get my workflow streamlined to a point where I can... I can get that quality or as close to it as I can in just um, a shorter amount of time, you know, and where um, um, I wish I had the time and I wish I could play with it, but, you know, and the tools are great. I, you know, I always say it's a poor craftsman that blames his tools and uh, I've had to adapt <laughs> to a lot of ways of doing things uh, that may not be, you know, when I walk into a studio and they have a particular console there, uh, I can't walk into that studio and go, oh, no, no, I can't work on this. I, you know, I need my control surfaces or whatever. You just, you do the best you can with the tools that you have and you, uh, you uh, maximize the efficiency. And uh, I, I use tape simulators on my dialogue chain I have a Revox uh, tape simulator. And um, again, I've done ABs and the final step in my dialogue chain is going through this tape machine uh, that yeah. uh, Universal Audio makes. And I hear the difference. They've done such a great job at emulating that particular tape machine and giving you uh, control over the bias settings, over what kind of tape you use, over what kind of tape speed you're going to hit it with, uh, how much saturation you can get on the tape. Uh, they, it does a pretty good job of it. Yeah. And, and uh, now like this, it, as technology advances, it's getting cheaper and cheaper to uh, kind of recreate this. Like I have right now a Universal Audio Apollo Twin with the, you know, I have the incredible preamps in there. And uh, like, it's just so easy to get such a great sound at home. But what you have is very different because uh, for those of you watching, Frank is in his uh, home studio right now that uh, I've been to. And that thing rivals m like most like recording studios you would find in Los Angeles and New York City. Tell us about your home setup. Uh, 
Well, it started out pretty innocently as uh, a friend of mine and I, uh, we were sitting around one day and uh, he had this riff he was playing on his guitar. And I thought, oh, you know, that's pretty cool. We, we, we should, you know, do something with it. And I had a basic Pro Tools LE system set up at home uh, with, I think we were maxed out at 32 tracks. And so I laid down a drum track and uh, we just laid it out. I had a patio area and we were just recording on that. So when it came time to renovate our home, uh, I took one of the rooms that we had and uh, it turned into uh, what started innocently enough that went from a stereo music setup to, uh, well, we got the walls down. We might as well build a room within a room. We might as well, uh, uh, you know, isolate it. We might as well, oh, well, I'm stereo. I might as well go 5-1. <laughs> well, I'm 5-1. We should go 7-1. And, uh, you know, if you're going 5-1 or 7-1, then you need an LCR, good reference set of speakers as well as the Yamahas and the Oratones. And if you're going to get, you know, I went with Westlake Pros, uh, Westlake BBS M6s for my main monitors. Uh, well, if you're going to get the Westlakes, you really got to power them with a Bryson amp. Okay, sure. Of course. Yeah, let's power You can't afford not to. <laughs> and if you're going to do that, well, then, you know, your Pro Tools should be, uh, you need a good, IO, Avid IO for that. Yeah, okay, sure. Well, if you've got the IO and the price, you're going to have to build a machine room so you don't you know, hear the computer. <laughs> yeah, you're it's, right. If you give a Musa up and he's going to want some milk and you you always have to, you got to keep up with the last thing that you, you purchased for the upgrade. So, all right, here's a fun question for you. If you were given, this is almost like one of those, like you're deserted on an island kind of questions. If you had to mix sound and you were given, uh, like you didn't have access to your studio, you were given a thousand dollars. What are you prioritizing in order to, like, is it your, is it your monitors? Is it your computer? Uh, you know, your 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 preamps. What are you What are you putting the most focus in? That's a that's a, a good question, especially limiting it to a thousand dollars. Let's see. <laughs> well. Definitely, um, definitely a, a, a really accurate, accurate monitoring system. And, uh, you know, which is uh, what I've been using on the stage as well as at home. Um, I have, you know, the ultimate ears. I have the Capitol Records. Uh, reference. That was smooth, man. That was a smooth. What what a wonderful way to to. to call out our uh, our host here but yeah keep going sorry i just i loved well I, I didn't even have that in mind when i asked that question but that was awesome well but it's the absolute truth because the great thing about the ultimate ears is uh, when we're uh when we're in the studio the only way to get through the shows at this point is uh, my uh, mixing partner and I, we're usually, we can't both be sharing the speakers because I need to go through and do a dialogue pass and uh, a music pass on it so he can balance the effects against it. And then we get together on the speakers. So we're each working offline and getting our parts of the mix in shape. So when he's on the speakers, I'm working on dialogue and music for the next scene that we'll be working on. And so when he's on the speakers, like we're doing Magnum PI, there's Ferraris, tires squealing, gunshots, and he's monitoring, we're monitoring between 82 to the sound levels are between 82 and sometimes get up to 95. And, uh, so I need something that I can still hear what I'm doing with because I can't go into another studio. So yeah. uh, the Ultimate Ears, the Capitol Records reference uh, Ultimate Ears is fantastic because it does two things. It totally isolates me from what he's doing. Even though he's blasting the room with sound, I can still hear detail in the mix. And... I need something that's referenced that I won't get any surprises with when I go back on the main monitors. And uh, 
the the ultimate ears, the the reference, uh, the, the capital reference ones are fantastic for that because I'm doing a lot of crucial mixing in them uh, between mm -hmm. dialogue, music, ADR, group, and all of those balances are really delicate, but especially uh, especially when I'm replacing dialogue lines with ADR, uh, and when I get them on the main monitors, if it doesn't translate, you know, our producer who's sitting behind us uh, pre-COVID uh, would, you know, that's going to be their first impression. Are they going to, uh, are they going to accept what you've done uh, and how you've matched it on that first pass through? Because if it doesn't, if it doesn't sell for him on that first listen, it's going to be difficult to sell it to him no matter what you do. So it's sure. so important for me to do for the work that I'm doing in my uh, in-ears to make sure that it's going to be 100 percent accurate when it goes to the uh, to the main monitors. And Ultimate Ears does that. I get absolutely no surprises. And the balances are so great. Uh, and I mix I mix a lot of music at home, still. Um, and uh, you know I have a, a a partner that we write a lot of music with. And uh, the great thing about it is I can I can stay on the ultimate ears and get a balance, then bring it to my mains, then bring it to the oratones, then bring it to the NS tens. And then, you know, um, make an MP3, go out to the car, listen to it in the car through a Bluetooth connection. And yeah. it translates. There are no surprises. Um, that's the great thing. And that's about the thing it. is like, and, and we were talking uh, right before this, just, and, and I want to continue this conversation on air, which is uh, the scope of what you have to mix for now. Um, is incredibly vast. Uh, so speak to that, and especially how um, monitoring is is probably the like the, the quality of your monitors is probably the most important thing for probably mixing a uh, mixing a project to to be both on a tiny little cell phone uh, speaker or in Dolby surround uh, in a in a massive theater. So um, how important is the monitors in that process for getting those to at least be close? Uh, it's uh, it's challenging. Uh, it's really challenging in the sense that um, when I was initially mixing music, we would just basically mix. So uh, we'd be on the main monitors and then go down to Aura Tones or NS Tens, and it had to translate because everybody was either listening in their car or they had pretty decent uh, systems at home that they would listen to. So uh, you would average it out for that uh, and. Uh, with music, uh, you know, as much as it had dynamic range, it has nowhere near the dynamic range that a uh, a show like Lost did or um, Sleepy Hollow or Magnum PI. So when you're mixing for uh, those extremes in playback systems where you know um, it's got to sound good on an iPhone, uh, somebody may be listening on an iPhone or an iPad, or they may have a really decent Atmos or Dolby theater, uh, uh, 5.1 theater set up in their home. You have to, uh, you have to go across that large range of what they'll be listening on, even their laptops on computer laptops. So what's important is uh, for us is to know, uh, you know, the approach that I've learned to take with it is you get it sounding as good as you possibly can uh, with a best case scenario in, in the best um, environment that you think they'll be listening on. And then you just, uh, you keep checking it down to something like an iPad or a set of oratones or, just a smaller near field setup and you, you make adjustments. Um, mm -hmm. um, and what we were doing a lot for feature films is when they would end up going to DVD, we would remix because we knew they'd be listening at lower levels 
and mm. the backgrounds would disappear normally, that would be the first thing to go. So we would actually do a, a mix just specifically for the DVD. But, it, you know, it, it, it is a good question because whether it's music now or whether it's television or film, you are uh, the dynamic range of uh, what you have to mix versus what it will be played back on is vast. It's huge. Sure. And, and uh, uh, we have some questions coming in from the internet that kind of pertain to this topic. So you you recommend, and uh, one of them is what, what do you recommend uh, for mixing? Uh, would you recommend, because you also have the UE11s, correct? Yes. Yeah. Uh, like I, I have someone asked, would you recommend big... something like that for mixing as well as stage performances? Uh, it's interesting because I have the UE11s and I use them when I'm just listening to music uh, for pleasure and listening back to artists that I enjoy. I like them because they're a little bit heavier in the top and the bottom and they give you, you know, a little bit more punch. But the Capitol Records ones, if you can get it right on those and when you do go to, let's say, you know, a bigger system or speakers. And if if you have a little bit more bottom coming out of it, because you've mixed on a flat, uh, a flat set of earpieces, uh, a little bit more bottom, I find, or a little bit more top doesn't hurt at all. Uh, uh, for me, it's accurate. Uh, accuracy is important in the mid range and the uh, Capitol record ones are very accurate. They're accurate all the way across. They don't hype the bottom. They don't hype the top. They're just a really good um, way to get you where you need to be in the ballpark. And then you can tweak from there. Sure. And uh, uh, again, if anybody has questions out there, please chat them to the, uh, the conversation on the NAM portal or go to YouTube hit subscribe on the ultimate ears pro channel to uh and comment on the stream you can ask questions via youtube as well in order to uh make yourself eligible to win a pair of ue lives with the ue switch uh, attachment you can customize them they are awesome so that's the grand prize or they're also giving away ultimate ears is also giving away four pairs of ue fits this week uh or get in on the savings with promo code nam20 for uh, the five and six, 20% off, or NAM 30 for um, seven and above. So 30% off of, you could get 30% off of the capital reference monitors. Uh, don't miss out on these savings. That sale only lasts this week. So um, kind of speaking to this this same uh, line of questioning, what are the, what are the benefits of in-ear monitor mixing that you don't get from like near field or just regular studio monitors? Uh well, you get the benefit of uh, hearing detail that um, a lot of the times uh, when I'm listening on the in-ear monitors, uh, I'll hear, especially if I have a mic open and I'm doing an overdub, I'll hear something like rumble in the background from some truck going by that when you're on your um, near field monitors, and again, you know, once that is well first of all you can't record with near field monitors open but for me um then the, the in-ear monitors also give you uh an intimacy with the sound that you don't get when you go to the near field monitors because you've got space around you you've got um physics that comes into play where you get uh depending on how far apart they are, your separation, your left-right separation. And what I really like uh, when I'm mixing music with in-ears on is I'll always do delays on the reverbs between the left and the right. I'll do a little bit of ping-ponging on some stuff so that um, uh, you get that kind of detail that when I go to the near fields and listen back to it on, on the near fields, I'll go, Huh. I thought it was much wider than that, but you know, because they're mixing with air around you and it's physics, they, you don't get that sense of detail that you get with the in ears. And that's sure. really important. Um, 
And uh, yes, uh, this is kind of changing course, but uh, I also wanted to know what was the name of that tape simulator that you were talking about, the uh, UA one? Oh, it's it's a Universal Audio, and they have uh, a, a tape bundle, and in it is a Revox uh, tape machine <laughs> that they have. Yeah, it, it's really good. <laughs> Uh, a lot of people make tape simulators. Uh, I know Waves makes one. Um, uh, there's another company that uh, makes one that's really good. That is, uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of it, but I can I can let you know. We can post it. But uh, sure. they're really good. If you get one that's really good quality, um, it really it it, it it rounds out the sound. It's like the tube saturators. I also use those on my dialogue. And again, it gets me closer to what I remember uh, in mixing when I was mixing on Mac when I first started out in the business. So I have a question about that. Um, how much how much are you you driving the tube saturator on a dialogue track? Because that's something, you know, I, I'm I'm used to using saturators on definitely drums uh even like piano just things that i want to like kind of brighten up and make them you know pop out of the mix or give them a little more intensity with dialogue uh i never would think to do that so how much how much are you driving a, a saturator on that well with all the plugins that i use and uh, it that goes for anything uh whether it be a compressor uh, a deesser a tube saturator, the tape simulator. Uh, my rule of thumb has always been to just barely tickle. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, when I look at the compressor, if it's working harder than just, you know, I have a multi-band compressor, and if it's working harder than just touching those bands, then I back off of it because I really, the one thing that I can really hear is if I over compress dialogue, and it really sucks all the life out of it. And for dialogue, it's just important to maintain the air, the dynamic range of it. And uh, uh, you definitely need to compress it a little bit. And you need the, like the, the, the tube saturator. Again, you know, I'll, I'll take it to an extreme just to see what it's doing and then start to back it off and back it off. And then once I get a setting that feels like it's it's uh, helping it and not hurting it, um, I bypass it to make sure that um, that what I'm doing is actually helping. But it's so easy to get seduced into overprocessing. And <laughs> uh, it, it's a it's a slippery slope because as you do it, you don't realize what you're doing to the original signal. So that bypass button for me, I'm constantly just going, uh, okay, have I gone, you know, how is the integrity of it still there? And it's a yeah. good practice to get into because with all the instances of plugins that you can have across all of your tracks, again, it's so easy to just do a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit on the bass, a little bit on the drums. Uh, uh, and eventually you just build it up. So the whole track goes from having a dynamic range of this much to down to that much. And for me, again, I, I'm very aware of it. I really like being gentle with all of the plugins that I use. And uh, it, it's, it, I think it's served me well because, you know, I may be wrong, but I think that's the way you should use a plugin. I know that there are, I've read a lot of um, the, the bulletin boards that say, oh, you know, if you do this and really compress it hard uh, on the snare, um, uh, it'll give you this kind of a sound. And I understand all of that. Again, it's a tool, and uh, you mm -hmm. know if you can get to where you want to go with that tool, it's all great. There's no right or wrong way to do it. Uh, I've started experimenting a lot uh, with uh, parallel compression, and I find mm. on certain orchestral instruments that that helps a lot just to blend in a little bit of a heavier compressed signal 
alongside with the original and having the dry wet combination on a plugin for me has been really interesting and useful on certain instruments again you know sure it's, uh, on that there note so is there a difference different... between oh i'm sorry keep going no i was just going to say there's so many ways to work there's no right or wrong way it's uh if it sounds sure. good uh and how you get there is really what makes an artist yeah and and on the uh parallel compression you were talking about um is there a this is this is you know a novice question is there a difference between um doing parallel compression where you have you 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 duplicate the tracks compress one and then figure out the blend between those of dry and wet or using the dry wet knob within the plugin itself uh, I like using the dry wet knob within the plugin, and okay. uh, again, that makes it easy for me to uh, just bypass it and see if I'm helping or hurting it. For me, that's just a really quick way to do it. That's interesting. And uh, another question that came in: um, uh, Do you still prefer analog mixing to digital, or does it just depend on the job? I think it uh, depends on the job for sure. But for what I do, and uh, again, the uh, time restraints and the uh, amount of quality we have to produce in a short amount of time in, in smaller budgets, um, I've been mixing in the box for a long time now, and I've been mixing on a control surface. I, where I mix at Technicolor, we have a System 5, and it's it's an incredible analog console if you want to use it that way. The EQs, the signal path on it are great, but it also has a control surface mode. And um, I'm finding that I, I'm using it in the control surface mode because it's much faster for me. And uh, I'm mixing uh, mostly exclusively all in the box now. Wow. Wow. So those, and I'm sure your board is, you know, takes up like three area codes um, at Technicolor. Uh, what is, like, is there still, like, but, you know, I've seen your home studio and then I know the type of board you're mixing on. Uh, what are the pros and cons of of being at home on the, you know, you're, you're a little more concise because you're in a, you know, you're in a house, uh, even though you have a beautiful home studio, it's still just a smaller footprint. Um, what are the benefits of like, you know, the behemoth board in the studio versus uh, kind of your comfort zone with your own technology and your more condensed space? Uh, the, bet, the, bet, the benefits of uh, the larger boards we have in the studio is you can, uh, you can really spread out your layouts a lot better and you get uh, more of an area of um, where you can work uh, and, uh, and the boards just, again, if you use them in their analog mode, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, they're maximized for signal integrity uh, and, you know, signal flow and path. And they're great. But uh, the one thing that we need more and more and more now is uh, if I work at it with it in the control surface mode, um, I'm working within pro tools and I'm working in the box. So my automation is intact. And I, you know, mm -hmm. I got caught once at Sony because they had the Harrison boards and I was using it in the analog mode. And it was still, it was a digital board in the sense that all the EQs I was using, they were all analog EQs. The signal path was analog, but I was still able to automate it. Uh, but then again, I was, working also on Pro Tools because all my plugins, I wanted to be able to automate the changes um, for different rooms and uh, different reverbs that I was using. Uh, I got caught there once though because you are writing two sets of automation. You're writing the automation going to the Harrison and you're writing the automation within Pro Tools. So to carry, uh -huh. if that project ever had to go to another studio that didn't have a Harrison console, um, it it would kind of put you in a tight spot. And so sure. uh, 
I've switched over to mixing all in the box because it doesn't matter where I take it. The automation is intact and um, it's, it's easier to manage for sure. Sure. And was it really difficult not working? Um, I mean, I'm sure the answer to this is yes, but uh, talk about the benefit of being right there with the sound effects mixer as well. Uh, yeah, that was a big adjustment because uh, when COVID shut down the Paramount Studios and the Technicolor building was also shut down with it, um, we had to adapt a different workflow where I would do, when we were both working from home, I would mix my dialogue and my music pass, <clears throat> send it over to him he would do his effects pass against my dialogue and my music. He would send it back to me. I would tweak my music and my dialogue. So it was a bit of an adjustment, but I have a great mixing partner, Robert Carr, who is, uh, we've gotten to know each other well enough in our mixing styles. It's like comparing, uh, best analogy is, uh, you know, it's like a bass player and a drummer in a band. Uh, you know, I know, where he's going to land. I know where I've got to land on it. And, uh, it's been, uh, it's been great and we made it work. Uh, it was an adjustment. Uh, and now that we're back on the Paramount lot that they've opened it up again, um, uh, it's, it's just a lot more fun because, uh, we, uh, one thing that over the years I've learned, uh, and always have felt is if you're not having fun, with what you're doing, it, especially in this business, you, you got to get out of it. So when we're <laughs> working together in the studio, we we have a great time and it keeps my uh, Rodney Dangerfield uh, lines up to spec. <laughs> it's uh, it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah, we missed uh, working together and, you know, we still work uh, independently as we're going through the mix, but it's just kind of good because he'll get to a section and he'll go, hey, I just want to play this for you. Let's see if we're in the ballpark. And we just both go online, we listen to it, and we make our adjustments on the spot versus sending files back and forth. Sure. Is it, is it ever like, uh, you know, siblings fighting over the sink whenever you're trying, like you want to work on something and he want, wants to work on something? Does that ever happen where you're like, come on, this was my slot. I need to take it. And like, no, I was my turn. No. No, interestingly enough, uh, we've never had that uh, because uh, I think we both understand, you know, we we each give, get, have to give each other enough time to get a good shot at getting the mix together. And we yeah. both have to give each other enough time so that we have a chance to play it back for ourselves and make the adjustments. And when we're making the adjustments together, it's uh, pretty seamless because, again, we've gotten to know each other's uh, styles well enough and respect sure. where, you know, I know if it's an effects moment, it's his. And I just lay out yeah. of it with music. I keep the music tucked underneath so he can have those. And he knows that if it's going to be a dialogue or a music moment, he tucks away. And it's... Uh, uh, it, it, it works out well. Having a good mixing partner is absolutely something that um, that is important with what we do to get. Sure. Get I had a and, whole like Brady Bunch scene in my head of you guys fighting. Mom! Um, so uh, again, we're wrapping up here. Uh, got a, time for a couple more questions. If you have last minute questions, please chat them to this uh, conversation within the NAM portal. Go over to YouTube right now to the Ultimate Ears Pro YouTube channel. Subscribe and comment on this screen and the screen on the stream for your chance to win a pair of fits or UE lives with the UE switch. So get on that right now. Uh, a couple more questions. Uh, what are the best ways to approach reverb and delay when mixing with IEMs? Is there a difference uh, with monitor and how you approach reverb or delays? Yeah, uh, they're actually, uh, again, what you hear uh, with uh, ultimate ears versus what is on the near fields. Um, I like to compare them both because you'll hear a lot more, uh, for example, on the reverb trail offs. Um, I tend to hear on the, uh, with the in-ears, 
I tend to hear where that trail off on the reverb is or uh, if that delay is a bit too much. And then when I go to the uh, near fields again, there's really no surprises, which is great. Uh, you know, the near fields will give you a broader uh, view uh, or a broader experience as far as what those reverbs are doing. But having the intimacy of the in-ears uh, with the sound is and because you're eliminating what the room is doing to the sound, basically. So mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> having the ability to have a reference speaker right on your ear and and eliminating the physics of the room is really beneficial because you're getting a true imaging of what you're doing. And then uh, again, there's no surprises. You go to uh, your near fields and it's always... Uh, it's always like, yeah, that works. That's great. Yeah. So whenever you like, you're doing mass, the biggest budget projects, and so you're mixing, you know, Dolby Seven One with Atmos, uh, you know, all kinds of different high tech systems. Are you able to mix those kind of sessions with uh, in ear monitors? Well, the dialogue is always uh, going to be fairly. Uh, focused on the middle. Uh, the dialogue is your anchor. And also when I'm mixing music, even though it's going to be spread out into Atmos, into overheads and the rears, um, I get an idea of what the balance is going to be when I'm listening on the in-ears against it. And then when we get to the main monitors, I have the choices of what instruments I'm going to put, like with Atmos, as objects and put them overhead and into uh, the surrounds as far as um, how much spread you're going to do on that. Uh, because uh, with music, I get split stems. So I'll get the percussion, I'll get the strings, I'll get the, uh, the, the keys. Uh, on, on Magnum, I have 72 stereo pairs that come in on that. And sometimes <laughs> it goes beyond that. So. Uh, the in-ears give me a really good starting point for balance. And then once we go onto the mains, that's where I do the tweaking as far as the spread goes. Uh, 72 stereo, That I guess that goes back to the question of what the benefit of the giant board is because you could have your assistant like, can you turn up the bass down there? Um, that's, a, that's, quite a, that's quite a session. Now, how, do you have to do, I'm sure you have to do separate mixes for each because i know like you know just in standard stereo mixing of music if you pan the guitar to the left suddenly that completely changes where that's sitting maybe some frequency response uh and how it's hitting your ears or something so do you have to do separate mixes for seven one with atmos seven one without atmos five one stereo mono for all of these projects well i I wish we had the time to do that. And on features, we'll often allocate time to do and check the down mixing. But with uh, broadcast, we really, um, we've got to deliver it all at once. But we do have our monitoring set up so that we can switch from Atmos to 5.1 to stereo. And get an immediate comparison of how everything is folding down but sure yeah we don't have the luxury of separate mixes uh for all of those formats but i have to say uh you know the mix downs translate pretty well there again we've never had any really big surprises when it comes to <laughs> uh, getting it all folded down uh yeah so um, yeah, the way and uh, yeah. yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say the way the templates are set up, it's really important to make sure that those fold downs are set up properly, so that mm -hmm. um, so that again you don't get any surprises when it gets to air. The way you describe broadcast, it, it just it seems like it's just constantly uh, like nineteen eighty five. New York Stock Exchange floor with everyone just yelling at each other, get it out, get it out. Um, so yeah. one more question I have, and this is a great subject. Uh, this kind of touches on the beginning of what we were talking about. 
this is a question from the internet and thank you everybody uh, for commenting and chatting your questions to Frank. Uh, I've, I've learned a ton just talking to you. Um, I've been taking notes on my computer about different plugins and methods of doing things, but um, how important is it to find a good mentor when first getting into mixing? And I had this question for you as well in a, in slightly different flavor. Is that kind of a requirement in your field um, in order to get in? Well, <clears throat> when I got in, there were no schools like they have now. Um, uh, they, they, you know, there's some excellent, excellent schools like Full Sail, uh, SCAD, uh, NYU. I mean, the list goes on, USC, the list just goes on and on. So uh, getting, uh, getting into one of those schools is a great starting point. But what I was fortunate, I feel, that I got in with a good mentor and what he taught me and what I learned through that mentor, I apply to this day. And I think it's mm. invaluable and finding a good mentor that will take you under his wings. And there is a program that the motion picture sound editors and the Cinema Audio Society, they all are a part of called EPMA is the acronym for it. And what it is, is uh, there's about, I believe 12 or 14 companies like Avid, uh, all involved in, uh, in mentorship programs. And, and uh, it's a great way to get access to go into studios and just sit back and watch and ask questions and uh, 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 just see how, because y you can learn theory and you can learn, you can, like these schools can get you, give you a basic foundation of what you need. Uh, but actually getting into a work scenario and getting work experience and learning properly because <clears throat> it's easy to fall into the trap of getting bad habits and mm -hmm. uh, uh, a good mentor will help you avoid those pitfalls and those traps and uh, because once you get those bad habits it's really hard to break them and uh, I, you know, I compare it to when I started playing drums, I was in a rock band and I had no, uh, no mentors or no proper uh, schooling. And when I finally did get um, into a position where I could get a good mentor and a good teacher, I had picked up so many bad habits that I had to break. It took years and years to break those habits terrible technique, uh, terrible uh, timing habits. And uh, it, uh, I think it's the same thing in this business. I mean, the one piece of advice I can give anybody out there is no Pro Tools. Pro Tools mm -hmm. is the de facto standard. Uh, when we hire a mix tech at Technicolor, that is the first and foremost skill that they have to have is knowing Pro Tools, knowing how to set up our sessions in the morning, knowing how to back them up, knowing if something goes awry, uh, if there's missing files that have to be relinked, um, all of those mm -hmm. things. It's so important that uh, our techs, and they're hired on that basis. If you don't know Pro Tools and you walk into a, a mixing stage, you are, and it's the same if you want to become an editor, if you want to become a dialogue editor, if you want to become a, a mixer, if you want to become a sound designer or sound supervisor. Um, all I can say is no Pro Tools. I mean, a, a mm. lot of the people I talk to have been weaned on um, Logic and Cubase, which are fantastic, uh, and they're great tools to have. But uh, if if you want to get deeper into post-production or, or, you know, uh, or, or editing or anything in, in our field, uh, Pro Tools is, is, a, is a must. You, you must. And, get and for anybody who's just kind of, you know, kicking the tires on it and they're interested in this, but they're not, Pro Tools, you know, it, it might seem overwhelmingly expensive. You can lease Pro Tools for like $25 a month, I think it is. Uh, you just need an yeah. iLock and, and, just start watching tutorials, start learning. Uh, we are unfortunately out of time, but before we go, I do want to say head over to YouTube right now, go to Ultimate Ears Pro, 
YouTube channel. Subscribe to it. Comment on this. That'll make you eligible for the prizes that uh, that Ultimate Ears is giving away this week. That is UE Fits. They're giving away four pairs of UE Fits wireless earbuds. They're incredible, technologically advanced. Also, the grand prize of UE Lives with the Switch upgrade. So you can customize it, have multiple pairs of face plates. So you can get black and maybe a, one with your logo on it, whatever you want. Go do that right now. And also this week and this week only, use promo code NAM20 for 20% off UE5 and 6 and NAM30 for 30% off UE7 and above. You can get the capital reference that Frank was talking about. Have the best monitor sound in your ears uh, for 30% off just this week. So head it over right now and take advantage of that. Uh, Frank, it's just always such a pleasure talking to you. I wish we had six hours to chat. Um, but thank you so much for taking time out of your morning and uh, answering everybody's questions today. Yeah, my pleasure, Nick. And uh, thank you. You you made it easy as always. <laughs> thank you very much. And what are you uh, what are you looking forward to coming up uh, with your projects? What are you what are you excited about? Uh, we've got a, a couple of projects coming in that uh, you know we uh, well it's kind of. You know, I don't know how much we can talk about them, but there's a couple of projects coming in that I'm looking forward to. Uh, and uh, uh, currently I'm on Roswell Legacies Magnum and uh, there's uh, there's a bunch coming down the road. But I, I'm just very grateful and appreciative that um, that I'm able to stay busy in in, in these crazy sure. times. And um, so. Um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll keep uh, I'll keep IMDb updated and my website. So the, the, uh, your website. I, what is your I website? Get, it's just frankmarone.com. It's easy. Awesome. So, what were you gonna say? Can you get what? I was gonna say, can I uh, shamelessly plug my website? But I did anyway. Oh my so gosh! Yeah. Too late. It's not shameless at all. That's just. That's the new age, man. Everything's a, everything's a marketing platform. Well, Frank, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to all you at NAM right now watching or on YouTube. Again, head over to YouTube, Ultimate Ears Pro. Subscribe, comment, win some stuff this week. Always a pleasure talking to you, Frank. Thank you, Nick. Pleasure. Thank you so much.